Hey everybody, hopefully my microphone's working and you can hear and see me. Just let me know in the chat if you can hear me and see me. My name is Justin Jackson and today on this stream, I want to talk about marketing mistakes programmers make. And this is leading up to the relaunch of my book, Marketing for Developers. I think it sold almost 4,000 copies. Uh, it hasn't been available for a year because I wanted to update the material inside of it. And um, I'm doing that right now. I'm getting ready to go to Laracon in New York City, and I'm hoping to have it out by then. But if you want more information on that, go to devmarketing.xyz, and uh, you can sign up for the waiting list, and you'll be the first to know when it relaunches. I'm pretty excited about it. There's a lot of things I've learned since I last published it that I think is going to be helpful for those of you trying to make progress as programmers who are launching your own thing. Uh, good to see some friends here. Uh, let's see who's in the chat. Brennan Dunn, Laurent Perrier, Michael Buckby, uh, Michael Newman, Kevin Griffith, a lot of, sorry, Kevin Griffin, uh, Apparent Software, Benjamin Carlson, Nate Cotney. Um, good to see all you folks. These are, a lot of you are people I've interacted with a lot online. And I like doing this because um, I think, well, on your side, you get to hear me speak and get a little bit more sense of who I am. And I also get to interact with you with, uh, interact with you in chat, which is great. Before we get started uh, on these mistakes that programmers make, I want to share you a story uh, from a while back about Coda 2, which is, is uh, an app made by Panic. And let me set the stage. I was uh, working for a software as a service company, uh, email newsletter company that, uh, and this is back, this is probably six years, seven years ago, uh, as the product manager. And one day I get a message from my coworker, Adam, uh, saying, hey, today is the day that Coda 2 is launching and it's 30% off only today. Now, this interaction is interesting in of itself because the reason Adam was messaging me is I was the guy in the office who ended up buying most of the software or buying most of the stuff. I had a company credit card and uh, I was always eager to you know, buy tools that were going to solve our problems. And uh, so Adam is messaging me, the product manager, because I have the purchasing power uh, in this case. I'm the one that you know, often buys software. And uh, Adam and I were both fans of Panic. We followed them on Twitter. We followed their blog. Um, the, the founders had just done a really popular talk at XOXO. Um, and, you know, we, we love their design aesthetic. We, we just love this company. And so we basically pestered our boss into letting us buy Panic, uh, sorry, Coda 2. And I remember him asking us these questions like, are you sure you guys aren't just buying this because it's cool? And we're like, no, 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 this is going to be amazing. It's going to transform the way we code email templates and it's going to be amazing. And uh, we, you know, he said, okay, if you guys are sure about it, go ahead. And there was this urgency of the 30% discount. And so we went to the website. I plugged in my company card and we bought Coda 2. Now, guess what? Neither of us ended up incorporating Coda 2 into our workflows. It was, we bought it, we like looked it over, we kind of drooled over the design, and then we never used it again. And I think there's an interesting, uh, a bunch of interesting lessons in that story for software developers, for people making software. Um, and I'd like to go through a few of those right now. 
Let's just make, check in on the chat. Everyone's with me? Good. And if you have questions in the chat, feel free to ask them. I'll try to get to them as I go along. So what did Coda, sorry, what did Panic do correctly? Got to get into focus here. What did Panic do correctly? Well, they were top of mind. They had built up this brand that people respected and followed. People are reading their blog posts. People are following them on Twitter. People, um, every time they do a release, it's an event. You know, every time they announce something new, it's an event. We were signed up for their mailing list. And so when we got the notification that Coda 2 is out and it's 30% off today, we cared. And uh, that is huge for anybody building a software product. You have to have some sort of awareness. People have to know that you exist. People have to know what you're working on. People have to care. And you can build up that social capital by doing things like blogging, like being active on Twitter, like having a YouTube channel. Nate Cotney has a YouTube channel. Uh, for, he's the uh, CEO of High Rise. He's always sharing about his life. Uh, you can build up social capital. You can build up awareness so that when you do do a launch, people actually care, right? And so they nailed that part. They, they, they got people to care. Uh, they also had a list to launch too. So, you know, they're coding away, making this new product. And then when it comes time to release it, it's not like they're scratching their heads going, well, how are we going to let people know about this? They had some channels that they could use to communicate with people. They had a big mailing list that they'd built up over years and years and years. Um, people posted it on Hacker News because the community cared. They'd built up all this social capital. So they've got all these great launch channels. They also built in urgency. Um, when you're trying to pull somebody into making a purchasing decision or push somebody into making a purchasing decision, um, it's, it's really easy for us to keep our wallets in our back pockets. And often we need something else that forces us to go, oh man, I got to take out this wallet right now and put it in my credit card number right now. And having a launch discount where it's, you know, 30% off for the next 48 hours, 30% off today only. Um, in the case of Adam and I, that discount and the idea of that discount disappearing was um, really the force that pushed us to buy, to convince our boss to, you know, let us buy a, a team license. Um, so... <laughs> I've got Peldy in here razzing me a little bit. I'm getting to that part. So Peldy's saying, I hope you're going to say that Panic's one-day discount strategy shouldn't be followed. Better to provide long-term value than tricking people. I think you should still uh, um, have, I, I think there's nothing wrong with a launch day discount. But the point that Peldy's talking about is the one I wanted to talk about next. And I think it's something that we miss. Too often, we think about uh, marketing and sales as just leading up, everything that leads up to actually getting the sale. And once we have people's money, we kind of forget about them. Now, this is a little bit less true in software as a service businesses where you have recurring revenue. But even then, I think people don't realize that churn, so customers canceling, that's a lagging metric. Uh, it's not like people just wake up one day and say, uh, you know what, I'm done with this and they cancel. People think about canceling for months and months and months and then finally they pull the trigger. And the piece that we're missing is that it's not just about buying, it's about actually getting long-term use, actual consumption and benefit, long-term benefit out of the product. It's not enough to get someone to just buy. You need to know, did this product actually make their life better? Does this product continue to give them progress in their life? And you know you've hit on something when people 
won't let go of it. And so I'm one of these people, I hate bringing this up because I always get made fun of, but I'll show you this screen here. Don't make fun of me. Hold on. I know someone, I know someone's going to giggle at this, but uh, let's see if I can find it here. Will it even let me open this up? I'm not sure if you can see this, but this right here is fireworks. It is, what version is this? Uh, CS5. I can't remember when this came out even. Um, oh, now it's going to be difficult for me to get back to my... Uh, <laughs> I'm locked in a, in a screen share. Oh, you can't really see it. It's just gray. But that's Fireworks CS5. And there is a larger group than you would think of us that are holding on to Fireworks for dear life. Um, fireworks is not retina... Uh, enabled that you that everything is all blocky in it uh, half of the things don't work anymore like the color picker doesn't work anymore but fireworks has given me so much value it it continues to make my life better every single day that I use it and I'm so used to using it that I don't want to give it up and as opposed to other things I've bought lots of image editing software since then and I just haven't used it. It has the the promise of a better life uh, with this new software, whether it's Sketch or whatever, hasn't been enough to to push me to actually want to to switch. And uh, for those of you that have been following me for a while, you're probably hearing a lot of jobs to be done language, and this is the first mistake that I think people who make software make is that they don't really understand the job that customers are hiring their software for. And that means not just getting them in the door, not just getting them to take out their credit card and buy, but actually giving them, uh, actually <laughs> having them consume the product and say, this made my life better and I'm going to continue to use it actually creating things that give people progress every time they use it. And if a lot of this has to do with the way we structure our marketing and our onboarding and those initial uh, first interactions with our product. So what could have Panic done differently to get us in our office to change our habit, to fire what we were using before and hire Coda 2. Um, and just as a side note, people who don't use your product, so people who buy and don't use your product, um, don't recommend your product to other people. Peldi was able to build Balsamic and have a, ha, and has built a great business because there are all of these users who use Balsamic every single day. And when you're using something every day, you talk about it to other people. You share it with other people. But I haven't talked about Coda 2 since today, uh, until today, because I don't use it. Balsamic. Am I, are you, you're making fun of my pronunciation? Balsamic. Balsamic? Balsamic. I want to know how Peldi says it. All right. So what could have uh, Panic done to get us to actually use Coda 2? Well, they already had us in the door. The next stage would have been asking us, personalizing the onboarding journey for us. And I'm not sure if... Um, Brennan Dunn is still in the chat here. He's working on something new called Write Message. And uh, Write Message is a lot about personalizing the marketing um, before people buy. But Brennan has also done a lot of work personalizing the onboarding experience. So what if the first email I got from Panic was, hey, thanks so much for buying. Um, just as a question, what are you using right now? What text editor are you firing in order to hire um, Coda 2? And maybe I would have said, uh, again, you guys are going to make fun of me, but 
still in the uh, HTML email world, a lot of people use Dreamweaver because it's the best way to build table style layouts. You can see everything. That's still what a lot of the industry uses. And so maybe they would have had a, you know, a bunch of links. Are you using Dreamweaver? Are you using Atom? Are you using uh, TextMate? Are you using, what are, what are you using? And if you click that link, they then personalize the onboarding experience for you, saying, okay, well, if you're switching off of Dreamweaver, here are some, some tips and tricks specifically for you. So get me, give me a, a quick win right away and uh, write that onboarding sequence just for me as someone who's switching off something and is moving to something else, right? Because that's what you're fighting for. Yeah, you got my dollar, but in, until I stop using the old app and start using your app, you haven't won yet. It's a long game. You can't just uh, go up to the point of getting their dollar and quit. You've got to take them right through to first usage, second usage, and then have people build a habit so that they use your product for a long time. Yes, table style layouts are still the uh, the standard for HTML emails. So that's one idea, is to customize your onboarding sequence for people. Ask them, what are you switching off of? What were you using before? Now in, um, who haven't I addressed here? Oh, uh, Logic Hop. Michael Newman is here. He's built a personalized, his app personalizes WordPress. So people might have not used any personalization before. So maybe that's one of the options. I haven't been using doing any personalization. Or maybe they were trying to do personalization with Optimizely, just creating A-B tests. But personalize the onboarding experience for those new customers. The other thing that we did at MailOut that was really successful, and a lot of software companies and software developers aren't willing to do this, but as a part of our onboarding, we would get on the phone and call every new customer. So someone would sign up, and that day they would get a phone call. And our whole goal with that phone call was to get them set up. So, hey, it's Justin from MailOut. Uh, I just want to help you get your email template set up. I want to help you get your account configured. I want to show you how to... Uh, send your first email newsletter. And when we started doing that, we decreased churn a ton. We had way more paying customers stick around just because we'd help uh, set them up for success, right? There's other ways to do this too in an automated way. Um, so if you're using Intercom, if you're using Mixpanel, you can have usage triggers. So if they haven't done these things, then notify them and say, hey, is there a way we can get you set up? Or even better, contact them and say, hey, let me get on a chat with you or get on the phone with you and help you get started because you're not using the product yet. Usage is one of the most important metrics, especially for a software as a service app. Um, uh, this is the one metric that a lot of uh, SaaS companies are scared to look at. I, I've done a bunch of consulting for uh, startups in Portland and San Francisco and London, and I always bring this up. I'm like, hey, we should look through Mixpanel and see who are the users who aren't using the product. And CEOs are petrified of that. It's like the thing they don't want to think about because they know there's a big group of users who aren't using the product but are paying for it. Okay, so number one mistake, not understanding the job that people are hiring you to do. Um, I think the, the other thing uh, that Panic could have done is they could have said, what are you using this for? You know, what are you using this for? Are you um, building websites? Are you building WordPress themes? Are you building HTML emails? Are you... Um, you know, what, what are you doing? What are you using this for? And um, again, personalized our onboarding journey based on that. 
Um, yeah, I think that's enough on that. Uh, there's lots more about jobs to be done that you can check out. I have a blog post on justinjackson.ca that just describes what is jobs to be done. Um, I also recommend Alan Clement's book, When Coffee and Kale Compete. And I'm going through Clayton Christensen's book right now, um, Competing Against Luck. I'm listening to the audio version. Highly recommend that if you want to understand jobs to be done. Number two, second mistake that developers make uh, when they're uh, building something new especially is we get so focused on product development and building the product that we don't build up anticipation for the launch. And what I'm talking about here is simply having a launch list. So, um, where's my... Using something like Card, I just discovered Card actually, let me show you this. Um, using something like Card and having some sort of landing page with a place for people to sign up, uh, a waiting list, launch list, sign up for something, is the bare minimum that you should be doing if you're building something new. And uh, I really like Card. It, it, uh, you can connect it to MailChimp and get people to sign up. Uh, it has all these beautiful templates. It looks really good on uh, all sorts of different screen sizes. Um, so that's one place to build a quick landing page. Uh, but build up anticipation. Get people to sign up for a waiting list. And this is a great opportunity for you to demonstrate that you understand what customers are hiring you to do. So, you know, I have a headline here. Um, this was going to be for a remote workers mailing list. And so, what, what are, what's the dream of a better life that people are looking for when they want a remote job? Well, they want freedom. And then all of your copy should just basically tell the story. Like, uh, in this case, it might be, you commute two hours every day. You want to move to a different city, but your desk job has got you chained down or something like that. Communicate that you understand what they want. What's their dream of a better life? And what's the pain that they're experiencing right now? And what are the obstacles they're going to have to overcome in order to get there? Clearly communicate that you understand their struggle and can articulate it maybe better than they could articulate it themselves. Um, so that's mistake number two. Build up anticipation. And you can't just put up this landing page and be done. You've got to figure out ways to drive traffic to that landing page. Uh, you've got to mention it every once in a while on Twitter. Uh, someone who's really good at this is Adam Wathen. I'll bet you if we went to Adam's Twitter right now, all he's doing is talking about what he's building right now. Let's see. Let's go to Twitter. Oh, you guys see this? Twitter.com. Yeah, okay. Twitter, Adam Wathen. So, He's working on test-driven Laravel. It's the pinned tweet. Um, he's building a new app called Kitetail, and he's doing live streams, streaming in five minutes. Uh, he's just always talking about... He, he, he's just made stickers. I'll bet you Brennan Dunn is just always talking about right message right now. If we go here, he's talking about demos. You can opt in right here. So people that are good at this, uh, here, here's he's leaking out a screenshot. People that are good at this, of good at building up anticipation, they're talking about their thing all of the time. And sometimes, uh, as developers, you're shy, too shy to talk about your thing. And building up anticipation means talking about it all the time. Uh, sometimes not. Sometimes it's not shyness that's the problem. It's 
perfectionism that's the problem. You don't want to show the world anything until it's done and perfect. And again, uh, if you look at people like Adam and Brennan and anyone that's good at this, they're okay with leaking out little screenshots and works in progress because, not because they want to show bad work but or unfinished work, but because they want to build up anticipation, right? So first step, as soon as you start coding something new, build a landing page for it and then just start mentioning your thing all of the time. Drive traffic to that landing page. Get people to sign up. Uh, send emails to that waiting list, showing them screenshots and things like that. And if you want like an actual script uh, for like a sequence for this, uh, the Marketing for Developers book has that sequence. So again, you can sign up at devmarketing.xyz. See what I just did there? Um, sign up there get on the waiting list and when the updated book launches you'll be the first to know but yeah i have a script on you know here's the kind of emails you can send so that was mistake number two not building up anticipation let's talk about channels and i see um buckby michael buckby's in here and this is something he talks about all the time is uh Products need reliable, reusable channels that can be sustained over a long period of time if they're going to survive. A product hunt launch is not a marketing strategy. It might be part of your launch strategy, but it's not a marketing strategy. Here is Mark Kuhlberger, who just did uh, a launch of an app called Faces. and you know, was, I think, had a pretty good product hunt launch. I think he was pretty high up there. But here's his launch stats. You know, 4,200 sessions, 282 people visited the sign-up page, 19 people signed up for the trial, zero dollars in revenue yet. And um, this isn't to say that, you know, Mark's product isn't going to succeed. In fact, maybe it just shows that <laughs> if you put all your eggs in the product hunt basket or the hacker news basket or whatever kind of uh, viral launch you're hoping to have, that's, uh, that's, that's not an intent-based audience. Meaning, product hunt people are just bored tech dudes browsing the internet. They might not be your demographic. They might not have a burning desire to make progress in the way that you're, you know, uh, promoting it. They might not have even thought about your type of product before. They might just be bored. And uh, if you launch on Product Hunt and don't get any signups, that's okay. the The key is you need to find reliable channels you can use over and over and over again. Which is why I want to talk about SEO. Um, SEO is something I've ignored for far too long and I think a lot of software companies ignore. Um, and you know, we're, there's been a big content marketing kind of boom. I love content marketing. I think it can be highly effective. I think it can be um, a sustainable strategy if it's done right. But SEO, finding those people, uh, sorry, connecting with those people who are searching for a solution on Google is a great strategy. It's something that almost all of my friends who have successful software companies have used. Let's do a little demo here. Um, so, if you go Google freelance proposal template, what do you, what comes up, right? These are people that are looking for something specific, right? I need a proposal template. And right down here is BidSketch. This is Ruben's app. And he has a freelancer writing proposal template. You put in your email and he'll send it to you. 
This strategy, I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a second just so I can look right at the screen. Every once in a while, I check in with Ruben. And by the way, there's, there's all these people like I'm good at being loud and obnoxious and, and getting attention. Ruben doesn't give a shit about that stuff. He's just like quiet, you know, quietly working away. Actually, he's not working that much these days in Portland. And he's built his whole marketing funnel on optimizing for Google search results, optimizing for people searching for freelancer proposal template. And he's really built his business off of this. This is how he makes his money. People searching for a solution. They want their life, they're struggling with something right now. They want their life to be better. And there's an obstacle that stands in their way. And you can't beat uh, people searching with intent. It's night and day between somebody stumbling on your cool blog post on Medium and somebody stumbling on your product on Product Hunt. It, it, those are just people who are bored searching for some entertainment. But when people are searching for a solution to their problem, that changes everything. So if you're a software developer, you should get to know SEO. SEO is one of the big updates I'm, I have planned for uh, both the Marketing for Developers book and the video tutorials. Uh, it's just so important and um, I've ignored it for too long. It's, it's really, really key. So that is a sustainable channel. That's a channel you can target, that you can start to rank for. Uh, you want to start now as opposed to later also. Um, you can start ranking for keywords now, even while you're building your app. Like Ruben's thing, let's go back to this again. This proposal template is something he uh, could have built while he was building his SaaS app. It, it's a, uh, I think it's a Excel and numbers document, basically. This is something you can build before you launch and get people in your funnel before you launch. Um, what's another good example of this? Um, I mean, I'm sure if we search for mock-up software, this is gonna this is gonna scare uh, Peldy. He's number one for mock-up software, right? So if I'm looking for mock-up software, once I get through all these ads, here is Balsamic right here. And once I get in here, it looks like I can download. I can download the app without even. Look at that! I can download the app without even paying for it. So I'm guessing that this, this will be a trial and then I can upgrade once I have it. This is really smart. All right. Uh, let me check in with the chat. Question. Do you think SEO has gotten complicated enough that a solo product owner can get good enough at it to be competitive without hiring out for marketing help? Um, so... Everything has gotten more competitive, for sure. Uh, who was I just talking to the other day that was like, you know, if we'd started later, it would have been a lot harder to get traction. Um, oh, I was just talking to someone the other day who's like, yeah, my software company would have had a lot harder time starting today than it would have back then. But that being said, uh, if people are still searching for something, that means they're not happy. So if there is some sort of, you know, if there's keywords that are still, you know, being searched every single month, it's because people are an unhappy with their current solution. And if they're unhappy with their current solution, that means there's opportunity for new products to come in and give those people the progress they desire. This is why I think understanding the job to be done is so important. Um, if you understand what people are hiring your product to do, and you've really built your product around that, giving them the progress they desire, then, and, and all of the functions around that, there's a functional element to, 
jobs, there's a social element, and there's an emotional element, right? So in the case of Coda 2, when I bought that from Panic, they nailed the social element. Like my friends and I were talking about it. We all wanted to be in the cool club. We all wanted it. They nailed the emotional element. We were all excited about it. They built up all the demand, but they failed at the functional element, which was they didn't actually get me using the software, right? Um, but when you understand all of those dynamics, you can use those to, in your SEO, you can, you can target content that hits those, uh, those struggles and those dreams of a better life and start ranking for them pretty quickly. Uh, and the, the trick I have is, um, let's see if I can show this to you quick. By the way, Ruben Gamez is who I was, I was talking about. He has an app called BidSketch, which is this right here, BidSketch.com. Okay, so if we go into dev marketing that right here, and let me, while I'm here, I'll go into Google Webmaster Tools. That's the other thing is a lot of people don't set up Webmaster Tools until it's too late. Oh, actually, let me just, um, I'll sign in without you guys looking at my, Login stuff. All right, so let's go to dev marketing. And we're going to go to fetches Google. Okay, so, oh yeah, this is a good example. This is a good example. Okay, so I noticed... <laughs> I noticed that um, when people were searching for marketing for developers, one of the things that came out of that, like under related keywords, let's see if I can find this actually, marketing for developers. It might not be showing up now, but as I went down this searches related to marketing for developers, I kind of went down this rabbit hole. Um, one of the things that eventually showed up was um, essentials for SaaS marketing, those keywords. Now, my buddy Ryan Battles has a book called SaaS, SaaS Essentials? Marketing, what is it? SaaS Marketing Essentials. Um, and, but I noticed these keywords kept showing up. Oh yeah, here, marketing for developers was a related search for SaaS essential marketing. And so what I did is I knew people were searching for it. And so I wrote a piece with that in mind. SaaS marketing essentials is the, the keyword here. And uh, I, this is exactly the process I went through. I wrote, I wrote the piece, like so, you know, went into WordPress, wrote the piece, and then I went in here and I put in the, the URL right here. Uh, let's see if there's a new one I can put in here. Just bear with me. I realize this is a little bit... I haven't done this one yet, right? Okay. So, uh, fetches Google. So, I just went in and put it in right here. Fetch and render. And then it, it's going to kind of crank away a little bit here. And in a minute, I'll show you what happens. But now if you search for... Um, what are the keywords again? SaaS marketing essentials. SaaS... Marketing Essentials. Um, I'm right here on the home. I'm right here on the first page. And I started ranking for this almost immediately after doing a fetch and render and then submitting for indexing. So it's a little bit slow right now. But uh, there are certain keywords that you can discover, certain jobs to be done that you can discover and you can start ranking for those keywords right away. Um, in this case, you know, I'm not at the top, but I'm pretty close. And, you know, Ryan's always going to own those key keywords. But for me to even be on the page is uh, not bad. Uh, yeah, this is still cranking away. But I think there's still lots of opportunity in SEO. Whew. Sometimes I just got to slow down here. <laughs> Um, 
if anyone else in the chat has any comments or questions about SEO, feel free to ask. I just switched from coffee to beer, hoping to uh, slow down how fast I'm speaking here. All right. Um, the fourth mistake developers make is I think they forget how important design and words are on a landing page. And, uh, and I'm just as, I'm actually just as guilty of this as anybody else. You know, often I'll try to design my own stuff and sometimes it turns out great and sometimes it turns out not so great. But people's first impressions when they come to your site, you know, they're deciding, should I hire this product to do this job that I have? And it has to inspire some confidence that, um, you know, you're a legitimate company, that you care about quality. And then in terms of the words on the page, that has to clearly communicate that you understand who's visiting the page right now. And this is why I think what Brennan is doing with Right Message and what um, Michael is doing with Logic Hop is so interesting. I'll open up both here and share the screen. Um, and actually, just to go back a step, what I was talking about is this right here. So you fetch as Google and then you request indexing. And you know, crawl only this URL. When I've done this, it's dr it's dramatically um, increased the speed in which Google crawls the page and then starts that page starts ranking on Google search results. Um, I don't know if it's always a winner, like it's always going to work, but every time I've done that process, the page has ranked faster than if I just done it. You know, waited for the crawler to come around and and crawl that page. So. That might be something you want to try out. So here is um, the right message page. Oh, this is brand new. Um, but communicating to people that you understand that they're in the right place. So in this case, sell more by personalizing your website. So if I'm looking to sell more, I know I'm in the right place. And eventually, you used to have personalization right on this page. <laughs> I don't know where it is now. Um, eventually, you want to get it really kind of narrow down and say, you know, are you a software owner? Are you a, um, who are you basically? Okay, this demo is not turning out as good because I, I can't see the personalization here. This is interesting on the Logic Hop site. He's showing some really basic um, personalization. But one thing he does know is that I came from Product Hunt. And so just saying, hey, I know who you are. You came from Product Hunt. That's enough to like get my interest. And then if you can really um, tell me that you understand me. So master marketing automation. Show the right content to the right person at the right time. The, these headlines and words matter a lot. So if I'm someone who's trying to figure out marketing automation and I land on this page and it says marketing, ma sorry, master marketing automation, I know I'm in the right place, right? Okay, this company, Logic Hop, understands me and I'm going to at least start scrolling down. This is cool because they start demoing the product right away. And um, and then you know continue to prove that they understand and know what I want. So design matters and words on the page matter, and that's why you want you might want to hire a designer um, for the dev marketing and tiny marketing wins. Um, pages. This is uh, a landing page template that I built with Hamish. Uh, he works at Buffer now, so you can't hire him anymore. But 
I've been able to use this a ton. It's really flexible and it's way nicer than anything I could have designed on my own. Uh, if I've also hired Tim Smith. Uh, he is T. Tim Smith on Twitter, I think. Let's see. Tim. Yeah, this guy here. Smithy. Smithy Timmy Tim. Uh, he's a great designer. He's done some great work for me. Um, okay, so Brennan says that right now, it's all of the personalization is by behavior. So it's based on, I'm guessing, what I end up reading on here, doing some lead scoring, things like that. So depending on what articles I read, it's going to eventually start personalizing the content I see based on this stuff here. Very cool. Uh, who's another good designer I think you guys should check out? Um, it's hard to find a good designer. I mentioned Card before. I think if you're not a designer, Card is a great uh, alternative to get a, a nice landing page up really quickly. Uh, some people use Wrap Bootstrap. Is, um, I, I still find it hard to find great stuff on here, but it's way better to use something like this than to use uh, Vanilla Bootstrap. So to actually, you know, get download something and customize it uh, is better than you know trying to start with Vanilla Bootstrap and do it yourself. All right, yeah, always wrap Bootstrap. I, is there any other alternatives people have used there uh, for a nice landing page design? My trick for the content on a, a landing page is always to start in a text editor. And uh, again, in, um, in the book, Marketing for Developers, I show here's the kind of things you want to communicate on a landing page. If I can bring up a text editor here. So I'll usually just start like this, um, kind of writing it in Markdown. Where is it? Notes. Oh, here we go. So, you know, this is your headline, but in the headline, I, I generally want to communicate who are you and what are you struggling with? Or otherwise, you could say, why? Uh, who are you and what brought you here today? <laughs> That's the headline of any landing page. Why are you here? And, um, you know, one of the headlines I'm considering for marketing for developers is just marketing is hard, <laughs> just like in, in quotations like that. And then um, something like uh, marketing for devs is uh, uh, software developers how to get customers or something like that. So who are you? Why are you here? What's your struggle? And how can I, what's my promise to you of a better life? How am I going to make your life better? Actually, I think right now the, the headline on marketing for developers is, um, oh yeah, the old one is a book and video course here. I'll, I'll show you this here. Uh, this is the this is the current uh, headline: a book and video course that will help you build, launch, and get your first hundred customers. So everything underneath the headline and subheadline basically need to back this up. So often I'll start talking about pain here. Um, you want to launch a successful software product. You've tried a bunch of times, but every launch falls flat. So right here, I'm really trying to dig into the pain. What's the pain that people feel um, related to this, right? Why would they hire my product? What progress are they trying to make? Um, it's discouraging. It's discouraging to build, to spend hours and hours on something and not 
see any results. All right, so there's the pain. And then the next step is, okay, well, what's the promise? It doesn't have to be this way. Be this way. The right framework, you can build and launch a software product people want. Right? And this is kind of the process I'll go through for a landing page. I always start with the content first, and then I'll take something like this into an uh, app like Card or my own landing page template, and I'll put it in. But I like the distraction-free uh, setting of just a text editor for figuring out what are the words, who is this for, why are they here, what brought them here today, how does my product help solve their problem? All right. Um, I've been going for a little while now. Is there any questions that people have before um, we shut this down for the day? I've got to go get my kid from summer camp sometime soon. Let me just go back through the chat, make sure I didn't miss. Um, okay, so uh, Kevin is trying to figure out how to get people to sign up for his Docker workshop. What would you recommend for him? Let's talk a little bit about research. Um, this is something that I think people miss. It's another reason having a, a mailing list of some sort is really helpful because I haven't found any uh, anything that compares to getting some people on a Skype call and getting some people on a phone call. So the question is, I've got a Docker workshop. How can I get people to sign up for it? You need to figure out what they're struggling with where they want to go, and what stands in their way. And there's other ways to get to that information, but I just want to say right now that nothing is going to compare to you actually getting some people on the phone and asking them questions. So for Kevin, if he's able to get anybody on the phone, anybody on a Skype call, I would be asking, um, what have you tried besides Docker? before. Uh, why didn't that work out? When you, what are you struggling with with Docker right now? Are you struggling with installing it? Are you struggling with getting your team to use it? You know, what's, see you Brennan, thanks for showing up man. Um, you know, what are, what are people struggling with? And also, why did you even consider using Docker in the first place? And what you're trying to do is build the story of here you have a software developer that's going through his or her life and w there are events in her life that cause her to become aware of Docker and then cause her to think, hmm, maybe Docker could help me and then tr cause her to try Docker and have it not work out or struggle with it. And that's the story that you want to be familiar with uh, when you're trying to convince people to sign up for your thing because you want to be able to communicate that you understand them, that you understand their story. So one way to find these people is to have a launch list and to have the, um, to have the first automated email with a Calendly link, uh, that's Calendly.com, that just says, hey, thanks so much for signing up. I would love to know what you're struggling with Docker, what you want to accomplish with Docker. Click this link and book a 30-minute Skype call with me. I promise you it won't be, you know, it'll be worth your time. I really want to understand how I can help you um, get better with Docker, what you're struggling with. And then you have that call and you take notes. And if you have a handful of those calls, you'll have a way better sense of what's going on. So I would have it one way to find those 
those folks is to uh, have it as a part of your email sequence, ask them when they sign up, and then ask them a few weeks after you've built some trust. You know, send some emails, you know, try to help them with things that you've already, pain you've already observed, and then ask them again, hey, do you want to do that Skype call I mentioned? Um, here's the link. Yeah, I, and I've noticed that Peldy's been doing this as well. Um, he's been doing these these Skype sessions. Um, yeah, here it is. Balsamic. Let's look at this here. Where's my... I am terrible at Windows management when I'm on a Hangout. Yeah. So this is what Peldy's doing right now. Oh, wait, this isn't it. Talk to Peldy. Uh, that link not work. Peldy, what's the link? Let's see if it shows up here. Here we go. So you can sign up for a video call. He's friendly, and he's got this form right here. Are you a Balsamic customer? Are you not? And this is great. One thing Peldy's done is he's built up a lot of social capital. So. The idea of getting to talk with him, uh, for a lot of people, that would be a dream to get to talk to him. He's he's uh, a hero for some folks. And so um, for him to have this form right on his site is a great way for him to get you know those people to show up. That, that approach might not work for you if you haven't built up that social capital yet, but um, guaranteed you're going to have a better chance of getting people on a call if you ask than if you don't ask. Let me show you a few other research methods, though. So we're all we're here to help. Um, we're here to help. Uh, who was it again? Is it Kevin? Ken. We're trying to help Ken get people to sign up for his Docker um, event. So one thing I often do is I'll start on Twitter and I'll just search for the keyword with a question mark. Let's see what shows up here. Uh, first, number one is a joke from I am developer. Um, let's see here. And you often have to go through a bunch. But you want to see what questions are asking people, what questions are people asking, what struggles are they having. Um, and again, you might have to dig for a while, but this is one thing I would do is just spend some time going through what questions are people asking on things like Twitter. Another thing you could do is go to places where Docker folks might hang out and then just see what are the kind of top ranked um, results for, for that keyword. And sometimes you might want to dig into the, uh, the, the, the comments, uh, especially on Hacker News, because people are so grumpy, they like to complain. And sometimes you can find um, what they're complaining about, right? So nested in these threads can be some struggles, some things that people are, are really struggling with. And what we're trying to do here, you might be saying like, why even bother doing all this research? I just need to get people to show up to my Docker workshop. Because nailing the positioning, really understanding the problems people are having is the key to getting people to sign up. It's the key to people wanting to share your event and your landing page with other folks. Um, it's really the foundation that you build everything on top of. And so if you don't understand the real struggle that people are having, in this case with Docker, and what their dream of a better life is, you're going to have a hard time attracting people. You're going to have a hard time getting people to show up. Um, you might also want to look at what other people have done that have been successful. So... If I search for Docker Workshop, this is probably going to come up with a bunch of 
spam. But uh, so here's a meetup. Um, this person said, amazing workshop from a great explainer. Okay, so who's that guy? What's he doing? Here is, uh, you know, a school. But you might want to just look at, okay, what are other people doing and what other, what kind of positioning have other people used to attract folks? Um, this is a, a free meetup group. Uh, there's 31 people going, so you can see there's some traction. Why are people showing up? Is there comments here? Uh, it's in another language. <laughs> I can't tell what's going on here, but... Um, you know, the comments are gold and also seeing what are other people using to attract folks to their event. And um, the other thing with events, events, books, courses, a lot of these are, are about building up social capital. And so if you haven't made a name for yourself, yet or you uh it's going to be a lot harder there's some ways you can maybe um like if you could team up with somebody that does have a name in that space that and they can use their social capital to bring people into your event that would be helpful but these kinds of things are really personality based businesses uh, people sign up partly because they have an emotional or social attachment to the host. And this is why, you know, folks that are really good at this are twitter.com, uh, Wes Boss, big Canadian, right? So 107,000 followers. He's just always trying to build up a following around his topics, JavaScript and Node and other things. And you know, there's a reason he's successful. Uh, he's built up a really kind of personality-based business around being that guy, right? Being the JavaScript, the React, the whatever that, the full stack guy. And um, that's, that, that's one reason he's able to attract people to his events and to his courses because he's built up that reputation over years. If you don't have that reputation yet, you're going to have to probably connect with some people that are influential in that space. Uh, <laughs> Fabrizio, I don't believe this. I believe you need to code and not play with marketing. Well, every successful software product splits their time in some way between product development and marketing. And um, Gabriel Weinberg, the founder of DuckDuckGo, his, his way of dividing that is he says he spends 50% of his time on marketing and promotion and 50% of his time coding and building the product. And so, and that's a pretty heady product, DuckDuckGo. Um, there, no, no marketing, no money, as Jed says. Question from Christoph. How would you get started if you have a product idea, but your working hypothesis is that most of your future customers don't yet know that they need your product? I actually just uh, answered a question about this on my blog. Uh, the post is justinjackson.ca slash need dash want. And here is the kind of the thesis. There are lots of things that people need that they don't necessarily <laughs> end up acting on. People need to lose weight. It's good for their long-term health. It'll make them live longer, but they don't. Right now, uh, the United States has uh, an obesity epidemic. Uh, there's more overweight people than there ever has been before. All of these people know that losing weight is good for them, but they haven't done anything to change their behavior. They need to lose weight, but they don't really want to yet. Uh, most of us know that um, 
we need to <laughs> we need to do something about the environment. We know that we need to reduce our consumption of fossil fuels. We need to um, you know quit driving our combustion engine automobiles so much. But most of us don't want it bad enough that we're willing to um, sacrifice uh, you know driving our cars and and doing things like that. But in both of those spaces, weight loss and the environment, there's some successful products that have been marketed for those companies. I mean, for those, those things, but it's not based on what people need. It's based on what they want. So let me explain this for you. And a lot of this comes out of uh, conversations I've had with James Clear, uh, who's writing a book on habits. And he says, the thing about good habits is that they have a long-term reward, but short-term pain, right? So people need to lose weight so that they don't have a uh, heart, heart attack or, you know, other health complications in 10, 20 years. But <laughs> in the, the short-term pain of that is so great. Like the idea of not getting to eat ice cream and having to eat salads all the time is so great that we, you just can't force yourself into the good habit. So, Christoph, back, back to your question. I don't think people buy products based on needs. I think they, based, they buy products based on what they want. Tesla, Elon Musk, is building a company based on humanity's long-term need to have environmental sustainability. But Elon Musk understands that people don't, at the end of the day, they don't give enough of a shit, they don't care enough that they're willing to sacrifice all sorts of things and have all the short-term pain to save the world one day. And so what did Tesla start with? They most electric cars up till that point were like these boxy things that basically just looked like uh, enhanced golf carts. Elon built a badass sports car. He built the, the Tesla Roadster. He made it into this amazing vehicle, this exotic car that people wanted the same way that every kid in the 80s wanted a Lamborghini Countach, right? And Sure, the car has a side effect of being electric and being good for the environment, but he, he, the reason people are buying it is because they wanted it. There was an emotional reaction to that car of, wow, that car is amazing. There was a social uh, reaction to that car, both uh, in terms of uh, virtue signaling, you know, like, Look at me, I'm a good environmental steward. Look at me drive this car around. Uh, also, it got it became known as a luxury vehicle. And so um, I was just talking to a friend who had rented a, a Tesla. My wife and I rented a Tesla. And then we have these friends that rented a Tesla. And he said he felt almost douchey picking up his kid in it because it is such a, a showstopper. Like people look at it and they know that's a special car. Right, so Elon nailed the emotional and social aspects of that, and it also has the function. It also he also nailed the functional parts too. He created these cars so that they would go long distances. You know, up until that point, cars, electric cars, could go 100 kilometers and then they'd be done. Um, Teslas will go 300, 400 kilometers on a charge. He built this network of of uh, chargers that charge cars really quickly, all right? So, uh, so to answer your question, Christoph, you have to connect <laughs> this need you've identified with something that people actually want. And um, if maybe in the comments, if you can clarify a little bit more about what you're building, that would be helpful. But that's my advice is you need People do not buy products based on needs. They'll say, even this is why interviewing customers sometimes doesn't work, is you'll say, so what do you need? And they'll say, well, I, could, I really want to be environmentally responsible. I really want to reduce the amount I'm driving my car. But in reality, what do they actually do? Do they really want that? You know? 
On the weight loss side, the example I give is LA weight loss. Uh, so people don't want to, you know, they need to lose weight, but they don't want it bad enough that they're willing to. It's too much pain, right? And so the, the hack, and this is something that James Clear taught me, is you've got to align this long-term long benefit with a short-term reward. Something that people want now that they're willing to, to experience some of that pain of switching to your product or using your product or learning a new product or spending the money. Something that's willing, they're willing to you know, over, overcome that pain, that threshold in order to get something now and then eventually experience you know, the long-term benefit. So what do good weight loss companies sell you? They sell you something you want, which is a sexy beach body, right? They have people before and after shots. Here's this person who's overweight. And then here's this person in a bathing suit, all tanned, looking sexy. And what are people buying? Are they buying the idea that they might not have a heart attack in 20 years? No, they're buying the idea of a sexy body now. So if I start working out, maybe in two to six to eight weeks, I'll be looking better and feeling better and feeling sexy, basically, right? We need to do the same thing with software products. Um, any technology company that doesn't align themselves with something that people want will not succeed. Segway was another example of this. Um, it's something that the world needed. The world needed you know, sustainable ecological transportation. But when people saw those things, they're like, I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to use that, right? Um, contrast that with, you know, these hoverboards that all the kids were using or a Tesla, um, you're aligning the, uh, you're aligning, you know, the long-term benefit with a short-term reward. Christoph, I would also be careful that you're not just building something that is just rationally makes sense. Uh, I think too often we build things that functionally we're like, the world needs this, right? Functionally, this thing needs to exist. Rationally, this software product needs to exist. But if you don't hit those other vectors, the emotional vector and the social vector, um, it's, it, 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 I've never seen a product succeed like that. Products succeed when they, they hit all three of those. They, there's a social, a social dynamic, there's a, an emotional dynamic, and there's a functional dynamic, and you have to hit all three. Um, long sip of beer. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not the poster boy for that, am I? Any other questions or um, I've got a few minutes left. Also, if you have a landing page you want me to look at quick, you could, um, you could let me know. Uh, Zach Gilbert in the chat is a great example of someone who, a uh, software developer who has teamed up with people that have great networks. So, uh, Let's, let's bring up some, some of Zach's stuff. Zach is a good case study here. Let's see, Zach. I like Zach a lot. Zach Gilbert, here we go. You guys all need to go f follow him on Twitter. He is Zach Gilbert on Twitter. Z-A-C-K-G-I-L-B-E-R-T. Um, Zach's teamed up with Paul Jarvis who, this is Paul Jarvis here. So Paul has 21,000 Twitter followers. Zach's got a respectable 1,300, but clearly Paul's built up a lot of social capital. And so when they launched WP Complete, they weren't launching to uh, crickets, right? They Paul had an existing mailing list and an existing following that they could market this to. And WP Complete is doing really well. Uh, and Zach brings the technical side of it, and Paul brings the design and uh, the audience to it. 
and Zach's built a few other things too. What's what's the other thing? Um, Fixtail is the other one that they're building together, right? So if you're a software developer and you know you haven't built up that social capital yet, you haven't built up that audience yet. Sometimes it makes sense to team up with somebody who has. And um, in this case, you know this has turned out to be a great partnership between Paul and Zach on these different products. Uh, let's go back to the chat. Just going through any of the other things. I think do you have a content on starting to build social capital from scratch. Yeah. So um, I'm trying to think if I've got anything right off the top of my head. I have a talk that I did at MicroConf called um, Amplification. Let's see. Amplification, MicroConf. Uh, I do talk about this in marketing for developers as well, but I think this talk here, who asked me this question? Uh, Laurent. So that talk there, Laurent, is a, um, a good talk on building social capital. Uh, I talk about it a lot on marketing for developers. Uh, I have quite a few posts on justinjackson.ca. Uh, that talks about that too. But the biggest thing is <laughs> just watch what the people who are good at this do. So Adam Wathen, Wes Boss, Paul Jarvis, um, you know, they are always just sharing things. So Adam's whole thing is as soon as he figures something out, he doesn't keep it to himself. He shares it with his audience. He's like, I'm I'm working really hard on this. I've just discovered something really cool. Here you go. And actually, Laurent, you know who's really good at this? Um, une autre, France, une autre uh, personne français is Sasha Graf. Sasha Graf, um, he, he hasn't been as active lately, but he was just really good at sharing what he was learning, really good at writing case studies. Um, and I think that's a great way to build up social capital. Uh, the folks at Basecamp have been doing this forever. They're just always writing, always sharing what they're learning, always, um, it's basically always just sharing what you're learning. That's how you build up social capital. I'm gonna answer one more question and then I'm gonna go. Thanks everybody for showing up. Um, if you could give this video a like and subscribe as well. Uh, I'm trying to get to 2000 subscribers. I think I'm at 1500 right now. Um, and oh yeah, I'll link to Sasha Grafe. Sasha Grafe is awesome. He is from Paris, but he writes better than most Anglophones. Um, this is his site right here. He's, he is amazing. He, uh, wrote a really popular book and course called Discover Meteor. And, um, yeah, he's just, he's, uh, he's awesome. Uh, and scroll down to his writing section if you want a kind of a good sense of what he's doing. Um, yeah, so give this video a like, subscribe, go check out devmarketing.xyz or xyz, depending on which pronunci pronunciation you like. Uh, sign up for the waiting list. Basically, everything I've described here in kind of a rambling way is articulated much more succinctly in the book. Um, so. Uh, working on a big update, hoping to have it done before I speak at Laracon, um, but for sure I'm going to have something out by the end of July. Last question. Uh, what do you think is the best way to build up your social capital, Twitter or a blog? I think, I think you need to figure out where your audience hangs out and then what channels that they pay attention to and then what are you personally good at? So again, uh, Michael Buckby is kind of big on this thing. Um, oh yeah, sorry. Is the book, I'll, I'll answer that question in a bit. Um, Michael Buckby is big on this idea of um, not blogging. He, he's, he thinks there's lots of other uh, ways to reach an audience and build up social capital that aren't blogging. And uh, part of that could be creating tools right? Like good open source tools, good um, 
just good tools on your website. A good example of this, I'm not sure if, Michael, if you saw this one, is, um, oh, this was top of, let me find it. I tweeted about it. This is just an open source project that built a ton of social capital for this guy. Here we go. This one here, Pell. So if you're a software developer and your audience is developers, releasing projects like this, great, um, you know, a great way to build up social capital. It's been starred 3,570 times. This is what it looks like. The simplest and smallest WussyWig editor for the web with no dependencies. I think it's like 1.1 kilobytes or something like that. The demos right here. This got a lot of traction on Hacker News and on um, Product Hunt. And it was just him creating something useful for, the, for his audience, right? Um, he, he makes computers do stuff and he, everything he makes is basically for software developers. Here he has uh, a simple notification system, right? So that's a great way to build up social capital. So the question isn't so much um, what's better, Twitter or blogging. The question is, where does your audience hang out? And then what channels, what mediums are you personally best at? And so I've been doing more video stuff because I don't know if I'm good at it, but I like it. Uh, and that helps a lot. If you really don't like writing, it's going to be hard to crank out a bunch of blog posts. Um, here's another example. Yeah, here's another example is Kudoku, which is a project by Andrew Culver. Here it is on GitHub. And I don't even know what this is, but <laughs> uh, robust subscription support for Ruby on Rails using Stripe. Okay, cool. So this is... Um, this is, uh, you know, for the anyone with a SaaS app, and it's subscription support for Ruby on Rails apps, and it also links to Churnbuster, which is his. He sold it, but that was his app. Cool. All right, guys, I'm slowing down. Um, is the book compliant with open source projects? Uh, it's written for people who want to make revenue from the software that they create. But all of the principles apply to open source as well. And there are some open source examples in the book. Um, the, there's lots of examples of ways an open source project can get more traction. So it depends on what your goals are. But if one of your goals is to get more traction for your open source project, I would say definitely marketing for developers would apply and would help you to, uh, to do that. So uh, a good way for you to get a sense of that is to, if you go to devmarketing.xyz, you can sign up for a sample chapter and that'll give you a sense of what's in the book and uh, how it might help you. And you're also free to uh, ask me on Twitter uh, if you want more clarification, I'm the letter M, letter I, Justin. And you can email me words at megamaker.co. Right on, folks. Thanks so much for showing up. Um, and I'll see you again next time. If you have an idea on some things that you'd like me to talk about in the future, let me know. And if there's um, any other way I can be helpful for you, let me know. Talk to you soon.